Joining us today is Dugald Maudsley. Dugald is a producer of a brand new documentary that will be coming up on the nature of things on January the 14th at nine o'clock on CBC television. Good to see you again, Dugald. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Mike. Well, you've got this brand new documentary called Curb Your Carbon, and we're going to talk about that, but I want to talk first of all about the 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 host. Now, normally we have we have David Suzuki as host of, of Nature of Things, but you've got a brand new host for this particular version. Tell us about that. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was a bit of a long road to get to this host, but uh, he made a lot of sense in a lot of ways. So uh, we have a very famous host, Ryan Reynolds, uh, is, is narrating our film, and uh, we really wanted him to do it for a number of reasons. Uh, the most important is that uh, we were trying to give people a documentary that was about empowerment and about hope and about a belief that we can do something. Climate change is such a depressing topic. And it's one that, you know, for we've heard over and over again, and we feel like there's nothing we can do. So we wanted a documentary that was going to make you believe and understand that you, there are things you can do. We also wanted to make it fun, which is an odd thing to say when you talk about climate change, right? <laughs> but I have done climate change stories for a long time. I'm not going to tell you how many years, but it's been decades. And it's always about gloom and doom. So we wanted something that was going to be fun and entertaining so you would stay with it, watch it, and, and be inspired by it. And so what better person to be narrating a film that's meant to be fun than one of the funniest guys in the world? And we were so lucky that Ryan Reynolds, one, is amazingly connected to the environment. He's been involved in an organization that plants trees. He's helped save the, the BC's great uh, white bear, a uh, great bear forest. He drives an electric car. He's really connected to that world. And also, he's got a great connection to the nature of things. He's watched David Suzuki since he was a kid. He really looks up to Suzuki. And when he was offered the opportunity to kind of step into David's shoes for one show, he jumped out. I know Ryan has uh, his own brood at home. And I think he has, uh, he has a real desire for his kids to be able to enjoy what he did as a young person in, in British Columbia. He's, he's a nice fit for the program. He is, he really has said in, in many, many interviews that he's done that, you know, he grew up in British Columbia in this beautiful place with trees, with ocean, uh, with mountains, and he really wants his kids, and he's got very young kids, he really wants those kids to have the opportunity to, to share on those things like he did. And I think he's feeling like many people of our generation that, that we really messed up and we're leaving this, this mess to our kids. Um, I feel that. I've got a 19-year-old and a 24-year-old. I sort of feel like, wow, I'm going to walk away from this disaster, and they're the ones who are going to have to deal with the crazy weather that we're going to have. Already we're seeing it out west, the, 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 the heat dome and all those kinds of things. So I think this is partly what's driving Ryan Reynolds. He really feels like, I want to do something to try to leave my kids the kind of thing that I had growing up. How did you fit into his schedule? Well, you know, he was a pretty accommodating guy, I have to say, all around. He, uh, he certainly had issues that uh, we had to deal with, and we thought we were going to be doing a, a narration record with him in Los Angeles, and then it turned out he was in New York because he was promoting a film. Uh, we thought we were going to do it in the studio, but then we had to do a remote record. You know, it just, it just has to, we had to be mobile, and, you know, he was very respectful of our, our timelines because we had to get the narration record done by a certain point to fit into our production schedule to get this film delivered on time. So it all worked out extremely well. Well, it's a, it is a, a, a fun episode and I'm sure people are really gonna enjoy it as a, as a documentary, but they're also going to take away some, some real lessons. I want to talk about a few of the vignettes uh, that you've got in this program. And uh, uh, <laughs> one of the, the segments that jumped out at me was this family of ninjas from Guelph, Ontario, <laughs> who ended up, who were stealing garbage of all things. <laughs> Tell us about that one. Well, this was, uh, I, have to, I have to say, this is a brainstorm of our writer, uh, Leo Morin. He's a very funny guy. And, uh, you know, we were dealing with all of the issues surrounding uh, the pandemic and our family wanted to wear masks. And we thought, well, maybe we just cover the masks up by putting them in ninja costumes. And, and it makes sense because we need to get some garbage um, because we're trying to figure out 
how much garbage does an average family waste? And, and really for me, it was backwards from there. First of all, it was like the stunning amount of food that we waste. Um, so much so that all the food that we waste, if you, if you looked at the greenhouse gas that comes from producing that food, it's as much as, uh, well, actually, it would make it third after the United States and, uh, and Canada. Sorry about that. Do you want me to start that over again, the banging <laughs> way here? Uh, I think the beep adds, adds a, a lovely element of reality to it. <laughs> <Sorry about that. laughs> I wouldn't well, worry about it. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so uh, the amount of food we waste, if you took the greenhouse gas from that, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world after the United States and, and China. So that was stunning in itself. Secondly, it's not the big farmers and, and grocery stores that are wasting the most amount of food. It's you and I. Now, that was really stunning for us. So we thought, well, how can we convey that idea? And so our, our writer came up with this idea that let's, let's get an average family, let, but let's put them in ninja. <laughs> let's make them ninjas and let's have them go steal their neighbor's garbage. And we, we can work out how much of that garbage that's thrown away is actually edible waste. And it turns out to be three kilograms per family. And that's an awful lot when you start to build it up over the entire uh, country. So Canadians waste uh, an awful lot of food and we try to show that visually in our film by creating a food map. I think it makes a really good point and, and it's a, a, a great example of what we can do as individuals to try and help the problem. Another vignette that I, I thought was innovative as well as visually interesting uh, was up in Whitehorse with the uh, students who were actually um, being shown how to reuse rather than throw things away. And in this case, it was uh, iPhones. Yeah. Again, we, we throw away a massive amount of stuff. And a phone is a great example. I know myself. We're all on two-year programs uh, with our, uh, our service providers. And after two years, we have a tendency to go, oh, well, they're going to give me a new phone for free if I sign up again. So let's get rid of this old phone. And uh, what we realized that is if you just hang on to that phone for another eight months, like not very long, uh, if we all did that, then we can save 35 million tons of carbon dioxide. So we tried to illustrate that by uh, focusing on this crazy guy down in California whose goal is to repair every single item ever made. He's putting up manuals and tools to allow us to do that. And one of the things that we, he's helping us repair are our phones uh, so that we don't throw them away. So yeah, we had these kids in Whitehorse connect to this guy down in California, and figure out how they can actually fix their phone. And it turns out it's not that hard to do. And, and this guy provides you with all the tools. So that illustrated just how easy it is to fix those phones and what a difference it would make if we held on to those phones a little longer. And phones are just one example. It could be anything. We throw away all sorts of stuff and uh, you know, that's, a, that's a real problem. Well, you know, we're all uh, able to do different things in our daily lives to, to make a difference. And uh, there was uh, a, a segment uh, featuring uh, a German uh, racing driver, which I, I thought was a, a kind of an, an exciting segment. I thought, oh boy, this is this is going to be something. Uh, it turns out this racing driver, um, he, he doesn't hit the brakes. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, it, it was it was unexpected um, that uh, we got a guy who's not really burning any uh, racing car driver is not burning any gas, and uh, you know, really what it came down to was in the end. There's an entire Formula E circuit. So there's a circuit out there that just ha uses electronic cars, electric cars. And so that, that was a surprise to us. And uh, Andre uh, runs for, uh, drives for one of those teams. And he was great because he was really good at, at being able to explain how you drive more efficiently, which is what he has to do. That's how you win in Formula E is you drive efficiently as well as fast. And so he came up with all these tips that we could, we could use because it's hard for people to go from a, you know, a gas guzzling car to a fully electric car. It's not cheap. And so we thought, well, maybe let's talk about the kind of things that you can do to improve the efficiency of your car. And again, they're really simple things. Uh, you know, don't ride the brakes and ride at, a, drive at a steady pace and all that kind of stuff. Make sure there's not a bunch of junk in the trunk. I hadn't realized that. A lot of us carry uh, you know, kilograms of the stuff in the back. And you can really make your car travel more efficiently, use less gas, burn less CO2. That oh, was a, a great segment, very, very entertaining. Uh, going even further afield, and, and I really enjoyed this one because it, I, actually I just saw in the last day uh, an article about 
uh, planting trees using a drone and how they're, oh. they're, they're hoping to plant like a, 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 it was a, a few million trees using this drone technology. And I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting. And, and your example in this segment of nature of things was very down to earth. You went to Kenya to show some moms who are planting trees. Yeah, we were totally inspired by these women. Over the last uh, 15 years, they've, they've planted one and a half million trees, this one particular group. It's around Mount Kenya, which is the highest mountain in, in uh, Southern Africa. And uh, it's in a really unique place, which is, it attracted us because it's unique. Turns out that around the equator, that's the best place to plant trees because they grow faster uh, and they grow bigger than they do elsewhere in the world where we have to deal with winter. Um, but also trees, they really illustrated that trees are the thing of life. Um, because for them, trees meant that the water was captured. So they had more water for themselves and for the plants. They could grow other um, vegetables and things that they needed, uh, things for their families. So it really illustrated to us, one, it's amazing how you can plant trees if you put your mind to it, they did. Two, that those trees really, they can help you live your life in a really great way. And they're fantastic as carbon sinks. They suck in a huge amount of CO2. So it was a great story for us on all those different levels. And uh, of course, Kenya was a beautiful place to be. And it was pretty inspiring to see these women out doing this and to realize what a impact they'd made over a number of years. For those of us that are gardeners and lover of, lovers of nature, uh, trees are, are something that we certainly celebrate on a regular basis, particularly in the fall season when all the leaves turn color. But it, it reminds us that the trees that we may have on our own properties or even uh, the bushes and, and what have you are uh, not only beautiful to see, but really do add uh, to helping uh, alleviate one part of, of this rather large problem that we've got. Yeah. They're super efficient at, uh, at capturing carbon. And as you say, it's not that difficult you know, to plant a tree on your own property. I was going to say, I, I, don't, I don't want to give away all the secrets of, of, of the <laughs> upcoming episode. Yeah. But I did want to touch on the one from New Zealand uh, because we, I think we all know New Zealand loves their rugby. And there was a, a great segment involving some rugby players and, and uh, showing exactly um, what it means to um, uh, have meat in your diet an abundance of meat in your diet. Yeah, well, poor Kiwis, we picked on them uh, partially because beyond the only, them and the United States, they're the two largest meat eaters in, in the world. And Canada is not too far behind, I have to say. Um, and so we were looking, trying to get a sense of, well, what does, what does eating meat actually mean? And, and it turns out that the, the whole supply chain uh, to create beef and get that onto our table is, has a pretty big impact on, on climate change. Um, and the whole livestock industry, just to give you one figure, creates 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year. So it's a, it's a, it's a huge amount. And so what we were looking at is a, an interesting way to illustrate what it would mean if we all just ate one less meal of meat uh, every, every week. And, you know, I'll, I'll leave those statistics to the film because they're, they're really interesting. We decided to come up with this rugby team to help us illustrate. Um, so we had one team eat tofu and, and the other side of the team eat meat. And, uh, and there were certain consequences to that. Of course, the, the guys who got the steak were pretty excited about that until they found out what that meant for them. Uh, whereas the guys who got the tofu thought they were eating rabbit food, but it worked out pretty well for them in the end. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think people will en enjoy that. It was, it was a pretty funny ending to that segment. Now, you also uh, cover topics uh, such as uh, general transportation and and we know certainly in, in cities, um, using urban transit or getting on a bike or walking are certainly alternate uh, solutions to the problems that we face, as opposed to driving your car 20 city blocks. Uh, maybe you could take a bicycle ride. And uh, your, your segment in Hamilton does a nice job on that. So uh, our um, researcher and uh, co-producer, Monica Delmos, came up with this great idea to illustrate, well, what are our options if we don't want to go to an electric car? 
uh, is there another thing we can do? And so the idea was, well, there are e-bikes out there now and they're becoming very popular. But I think there's a big feeling that, wow, you know, how can I replace my car with an e-bike? So we thought, let's have this little idea of having the car race the e-bike just to see what the differences might be. Not only in carbon dioxide created, but how long it might take you to get from A to B. So we had them race through Hamilton. And, uh, and, and that gave us a really good feel for how much CO2 the car was creating versus the electric bike. Uh, but also, too, what other benefits you gain from riding a bike. Um, it was just a, it's just a way of, of making people think. And also, I think it's things that you and I can do, right? We, we can choose not to use the car, as you say, to go a short distance. We can ride our bike, whether it's a pedal bike or an electric bike. We can do those sorts of things. And, and that's really the overall goal of the film is just to open your eyes to the things that are really doable uh, for you and I. And this is one of them. I think uh, the, the program does a, a really nice job on the graphic representations as well, because, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, a, a ton of carbon, you know, we, we, we kind of have this vague image of what that might be, but you've really done a nice job uh, showing exactly what that means. Yeah, it was one of our big goals, and it was a, we have a, a brilliant animator, Mark Alberts. Um, he has done all of our films for years, and he created these extraordinary animations that we wanted to make very realistic to fit the rest of our film. Uh, but we also wanted to try to get an idea of, well, if you take a million different small actions, you do something, I do something, somebody else does something, and you put them together, what kind of impact does it have? And that's really the, the big lesson for me out of this film was that if you do put a, actions together, they really add up and you can really start to, to have an impact on carbon dioxide. So we wanted to try to give you that feeling. And, you know, we realized at one point, uh, carbon dioxide is just a gas. What does it actually look like? You know, it's hard to get your head wrapped around that. So we really did the numbers and we came, came up with a giant ball of carbon. Uh, and, and we really worked out how big it was compared to a car, which it crushes. Um, all animated, no one is hurt in any of these animations, um, but it gives you a bit of a feel for what you're dealing with. So try to get your head wrapped around some of these concepts, which can be a little bit hard. And the animations turn them into th to, to real well, things. All in all, it's a, a very, very entertaining show. It's a great hour. And all the way through, there's really good advice. And I think there will be some triggers for everybody that watches it you know as you say our ability to take small actions to try and make a difference and hopefully if everybody does that we will see some good effect and obviously in this program uh, uh, having ryan reynolds as your narrator um, just adds to the overall entertainment value of the uh, of the show and and you must be pretty pleased with the end result we are, we're very pleased. And, and part of the advantage, I think, of having someone like Ryan Reynolds, who has these great uh, green credentials, is hopefully the message gets out to a wider group of people than it, than it might normally do. And if it does that, we'll be pleased because really part of our goal in making this film is to, to empower people, to make them feel that there, is, or there are things they can do. And if, if, if Ryan Reynolds helps us get that message out to a larger audience, I know he'll be pleased and, and certainly we will too. Thanks for joining us today, Dugal. Good to see you again, and uh, congratulations on a, a fine production. Thanks, Mike. Great to be with you, as always. Our guest has been Dugald Maudsley. Dugald is producer of a brand-new documentary appearing on The Nature of Things, and it's coming up January the 14th, 9 o'clock, and it will be on CBC Television and CBC Gem. Don't miss it. You'll really have a good time, and who knows, you might get a few good tips for your own household.